Thank, thank you, Deputy President, and I rise to speak to this cognate debate um, and, in doing so, respond to the state budget. And I think it's not surprising that the headline issue on this budget is the state's health system. And, you know, we know that the pandemic, this, this budget does go to try and ease some of those pressure points that the pandemic um, really brought to the front. But we know that the, the health system has had those pressure points for a number of years, and certainly COVID has, and this pandemic has exacerbated that. So, our, but our healthcare professionals have worked tirelessly through this pandemic, um, tirelessly. But as we all know, and as our constituents tell us um, day by day, our hospitals are st stretched and our staff are absolutely exhausted. And let's not forget the allied health workforce as well. They're working just as hard with the same patients, in the same, with the same conditions, with the same PPE, and their contributions are significant. So the $2.9 in infrastructure, health infrastructure, the 2.4 for emergency staff and new wards, the 7,000 healthcare workers, including 5,000 nurses, is really good for Victoria. And it's certainly, you know, probably what the community expected. I know when I've been out there and asking people about the budget, I don't think anyone was surprised by it. I don't think anyone was terribly excited, but I don't think anyone was surprised by it and that, that it had a health focus. And I think given the last two or so, two, three years we've had, that is not surprising. But what was surprising was the cuts in alcohol and other drug services to the extent of $40 million. You know, we know during COVID that people's alcohol consumption increased. We know during COVID that people's drug, drug issues were exacerbated alongside their mental health. We know this, um, but we saw cuts in this area. And I think this is this kind of short-sightedness or this, you know, I don't want to. Make, I shouldn't probably mention this word, but the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, rather than that fence at the top. Um, the alcohol and other drug sector has been starved of resources. We know the waiting times for people wanting, trying to get into treatment. The time when someone decides that they need help, being told that they have to wait six months for that help, um, is not acceptable. And I can't. You know, tell you how disappointed I am and how disappointed the really hardworking, dedicated alcohol and other drug workers are. You know, we don't have enough re rehab beds. We don't have enough treatment. We don't have enough counselling. Um, so, and, and the, the, the killer on this is that when you cut those services, when you cut alcohol and other drug treatment, you actually exacerbate the problems in our emergency rooms. You exacerbate the problems actually in our courts, in our mental health facilities. Um, you know, so when you cut alcohol and other drug services, you send those people back into our mainstream health system. So it's, you know, I, it just, I mean, frankly, it lacks reason. And I would really urge the, the treasurer to reconsider this and to look at the benefits. We know that when we spend money on harm reduction, harm minimisation, for every dollar we spend, we save $27. And that's because we avoid someone getting called by an ambulance. That's because we avoid someone ending up in our emergency department. That's because we, end up, we, we avoid someone ending up in our prisons. Um, so please, Treasurer, this, this is, um, is short-sighted cuts to this budget, and it's something that we need to remedy. Now, in November, I introduced a motion into this chamber that called on this government to introduce a dedicated portfolio for loneliness, um, and that was passed through this House with, with the government's support. And I'm sure that many of you are conscious that loneliness has, has emerged as one of the most serious public health challenges being faced around the world. Loneliness is a better predictor 
of premature death than physical inactivity. Obesity or smoking 15 cigarettes a day, it, loneliness is a better predictor than those two um, activities. Lonely Australians have significantly worse, health, significantly worse health status than Australians who do not experience loneliness. So I have to say I was really pleased to see the government quite literally put their money where their mouth is and invest directly in loneliness by way of $9 million to establish 10 new, 10 new social inclusion action groups in local government areas. This will foster connection reduce so and reduce social isolation in vulnerable groups. Uh, this is, I, I'm really pleased that this is a win for a reason policy. Um, now, the budget has allocated significant resources, $1.8 um, into building new schools and upgrading existing ones. But again, schools in, the nor in my electorate of Northern Metropolitan have missed out. Coburg High School. This, this school has grown exponentially, and I remember being there back in 2016 when it was just a newly opened school that was accepting just maybe two or three grades. It's now got a population in excess of 12, 1,250 students. Um, it's lacking science rooms. Students are now having to do their music lessons in a storeroom. Uh, it desperately needs funds. And the picture is no better for nearby schools like Glenroy College and John Faulkner Secondary College. You know, if we wanted to tell some of our most disadvantaged communities that we really didn't care a fig about them, we would send them to some of those schools. And it is reprehensible that we have not invested in those schools where we have invested in far wealthier schools. Um, these deserve funding and I, I would urge the Minister for Education to keep this front of mind. Not only are we seeing these schools um, being decimated through the lack of funding and just literally falling apart around the students' ears, um, we're seeing these really bright kids that you look at the results in our primary schools in those areas, the primary schools that feed into those high schools, and their results are well above average. These are smart kids. And then you look at the results at John Faulkner or Glenroy, and those results have dropped down. So not surprisingly, um, parents are not wanting to send their children to those, those schools, so we're seeing overcrowding in other schools. Um, we have these schools, we have these growing areas, and we need to address this. And, and I implore the government to invest in the North. Um, it has been neglected. I was in Broadmeadows on the weekend, and you only have to look at Broadmeadows Station to see the neglect that the North has. Um, I was assured at the function I was at to celebrate the work of volunteers in the North that, that the government had earmarked an upgrade to Broadmeadows Station by 2050. 2050. Now, this is a place where you don't, you know, you don't actually even want to walk through those sta that station and the underpasses in daylight, let alone on a winter's evening. Um, it's frightful. It is absolutely frightful and it sends a message to my constituents in the North that we just don't care. And this is, an, this is, a, this is a postcode that is some of the most disadvantaged people. This is where we should be investing. You know, I, and, you know, and I continue to promote small business and innovation and we know those are the drivers to future economy. Um, and we must be responsive to that startup sector and emerging industries and nurture those bright new ideas capable of capitulating our economy, catapulting our economy. And, you know, we've seen this in, in Victoria. We, you know, we're actually responsible for a number of unicorns. Uh, and I think we should be proud of that. And I'd, I'd have to say that I'd, I think that um, the government's approach to um, attracting international businesses. Um, most uh, is, has been well funded, particularly in that medical research area, and that's in my electorate around, around Parkville. We've seen some great work in that area. What I particularly um, ha endorse is the Equity Investment Pilot Fund. So this is about providing equity to those startups. This is really welcomed out there um, in, in the startup industry. Uh, also providing grants to people looking at low, 
uh, small businesses looking at low carbon manufacturing. Again, this is something in the north that we used to be very good at. We used to be manufacturers in the north, but we have these opportunities. And I, and I welcome the government's um, investment in there. You know, I look at things like mineral sands. Um, you know, the, the opportunities there when you know, I, for one, drive an electric vehicle, I know that the, that the, that the minerals in the, that made that vehicle um, are rare and precious, and we have great reserves in Victoria. And certainly, you know, shout out to Manangatang. Um, there is an area where we have some mineral sand. So I look forward to seeing governments invest in those areas um, and, and help us and keep that in Australia. So don't, <clears throat> don't allow those big in multinationals to come in, take, you know, reap what they need and then, and then leave, leave a, well, under mineral sands, a, a fairly shallow, shallow, shallow hole, but a hole nonetheless. Um, I mean, look, there's more we could say about this. I, I think the other missed opportunity was an investment in hemp. We, you know, I spoke um, at length about this last, at the last, last sitting week, so I won't do it again. Um, but we, we certainly need to invest in areas like hemp. We need to make it easier for hemp growers. We know that these are the types of new, manuf that these, are the types of new crops that will enable really new and innovative and low carbon manufacturing to occur in, in Australia. Um, let's also not forget women's health. And we've, we certainly saw some investment into women's health. We didn't see enough. And I think something that I've been trying to highlight in this place has been the issue of endometriosis. Now, We've heard a lot of talk, but we haven't seen the investment come into play. Now, I, I thank the government for, for committing to an endometriosis centre, um, but we didn't see any money for it. So I'm hopeful that we will see some announcements and some commitments to that. I, I hope both sides of this chamber commit to, to, to really funding endometriosis research, endometriosis treatment, and most importantly, a cure for endometriosis. Uh, it affects, it's a, it's a de, you know, it, it's debilitating. It affects one in nine women. Um, yet we spend more money on, um, on snoring than we do on endometriosis. We spend more money on sleep apnea than we do on endometriosis by a considerable amount. So, Again, it is a call out again that the government may commit to significant funding um, to the various really innovative organisations operating, operating here, uh, whether they're operating out of the Epworth, whether they're operating under Hudson, Monash, they're the, women's, the women's hospital. There's really great dedicated researchers that just need a little bit of love from the government. Um, Removing the current land, tra transfer, land transfer duty exemption, applying to the transfer of dutiable properties to an institution with a religious purpose. Um, and this is another great way of bringing in some much needed funds. Uh, the net, we, we understand, and this is through the PBO, and this is through other research, this would bring in another $13 million. Um, over the next couple of years. We pay transfer duty we pay when we buy and sell our homes, so why shouldn't religious organisations? It was just a few years ago now that Fairfax revealed that the Catholic Church holds assets in Victoria valued at more than $9 billion, including banks, a superannuation fund, an insurance company, a news service and a telecommunications provider. Properties reportedly include offices, residents, car parks, conference centres, tennis courts, mobile phone towers and a restaurant. They are the largest non-government landholder in the state, so why should that wealth be duty free? Of course, I can't, um, I can't contribute to a budget debate without mentioning the regulation of cannabis. Uh, we spend billions of dollars in prohibiting cannabis. 
Welcome, Mr Finn. Glad you came in just the right moment. Um, perfect timing. Um, you know, 200, like, we know we could actually earn about 200 million if we regulated cannabis, let alone the savings we could make if we regulated cannabis. You know, you never know, even Mr Finn might even, you know, investigate that proposition. It's not a radical policy, Mr Finn. It's happening all over the world. Uh, we're, seeing it, we're seeing it in Canada, France, Germany. Um, we've, we're most recently, I think, Mexico most recently, or more recently, Malta. Um, we're now nearly up to nearly 50% of the states in the United States now regulate the sale of can cannabis rather than prohibiting it. Um, and the outcomes, shock horror, horror have been positive. Um, the, the other area I just want to quickly touch on um, I, uh, is around the money that we spend on justice issues. You know, again, this is, um, this is, we're not spending enough around the causes of crime. The pro we, we are spending, again, we are spending on the ambulance, not on the fence. Um, and let me give you some examples. Take the Capital Works. We're spending, in this budget, $111 million on new justice projects, but only $80 million on housing projects. Um, we're spending $27 million on refuge and crisis accommodation. In fact, that is slightly less than what we're spending on the Faulkner Cemetery. Now, I'm pleased that the Faulkner Cemetery got some expansion money. Um, it's, it's needed. Uh, however, it, <laughs> it's needed. It is the, still the last tram stop on the line. Um, but really, to be spending more on a cemetery than on ro refuge and crisis accommodation means that we really do need to have a rethink about that. Um, you know, we spend, our spend on acute mental health beds is about half of what we spend on prison beds. And, you know, as some of the people in this chamber know, you know, we did a homelessness report. We understand that, you know, preventing homelessness prevents crime. We understand that, you know, in the homelessness inquiry, we saw this. In the justice inquiry, we saw this. And I would, again, you know, point out that, you know, we are locking people up via refusing bail because they don't have a home. We are affecting locking up people because they are homeless, not because of the crime would have accounted for a, for a, for a jail term. You know, look at, Ver I mean, the awful, awful cir circumstances of Veronica Nelson. She stole an ice cream. She died in our prisons. Um, a hydromorphone trial for clients, I, for clients of the supervised injecting room, I was very sad to see that that didn't get up. Again, we know by providing hydromorphone to clients, at the supervised injecting room, we would have reduced crime. We would have engaged those people into coming back from where they've been, engaged them back into services, engaged them back into treatment, and more importantly, stopped them having to um, traffic on the streets or purchase on the streets. We would have reduced the crime enormously, and I will keep on with the government about a hydromorphone trial. We've seen it in other areas. Um, I'd like to also put a shout out to the Legislative Council. I know that, the pe that, that those in the other chamber don't seem to know what we do here, um, and I've heard them say that more than once, and the budget shows that. We get a tiny amount of the budget, yet this is where law is actually passed. This is where law is reviewed. This is where law is effectively made. Our Legislative Council committees, our standing committees, do an enormous body of work, enormous body of work in policy. This is about connecting with our community. This is about our transparency and our accountability to our community. This is so important, and yet the Legislative Council gets a tiny proportion, two million. So again, I would um, implore the, um, uh, the, the Treasurer and the government to start spending um, and start valuing the work that this that this that this um, that this uh, house does. 
Finally, measures like the GDP, they're relevant, but they're not the whole picture. Other jurisdictions are working into a wellbeing budget, and I think we need to do that. Our constitution says that we are for and, for and on behalf of the people of Victoria now and into the future. We have to be measuring that. You know, I, the former chair of the United States Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, noted that the ultimate purpose of economics is to understand and promote the enhancement of well-being. Now, this, I, again, we would, I know that the government has shown some interest in this area. I would hope that the next budget that we see here will have some well-being e indexes. Let's measure that. And that's what I'd love to see in the next budget, more measurements of our well-being. You know, as a fun fact, the GDP went up when we had the, when we had the Black Saturday bushfires. GDP went up. So, you know, as far as the budget was concerned, that was a great result. So if we were to, but we know we need to measure the well-being of our community. That is what they, they, they expect us to do. That is what we need to do. It's not my permission, it's not my position to, to oppose a, a, a budget bill or a financial bill. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.